Welcome, guys, to the next episode of the Presence Podcast. Today, we're talking about a very significant event that happened a few days ago, the Great Solar Eclipse, 8th of April, 2024, and it has huge significant impact for our planet. So to talk about this topic, I've got Don Searle to help and uh, explain a bit of the importance of the solar eclipse. So Don, welcome to the show. Great. Hi, thank you. Thanks for having me. So guys, Don is an expert in the cosmos. He's worked at the planetarium in the early 70s and since then has been interested and enthusiastic about the cosmos, astronomy, the stars and how everything works. So he has a lot of experience to share with us about this very interesting solar eclipse. So Don, just to start off, what is a solar eclipse? Okay, well, eclipse is, is uh, primarily when the moon and the sun align in, particular, in a particular way with the earth. Either, either the uh, earth's in the way of the moon and we have a moonar eclipse, or the moon is in, 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 the, in, the, in the way of the sun, and we have a solar eclipse. So as the, the planets revolve, um, when they align in a particular way, um, then they would create an eclipse. And you'd have both a total eclipse, or what's called a partial eclipse. A partial eclipse is when only a portion of the planet is, is, is uh, in the way, and you'll get uh, uh, a particular shadow forming. It looked like a, a, a moon crest. You know, we, when you see it during the month, you see the moon, full moon, and you have a crest. The moon is just the way the sun and, and the earth is, is operating. Now, now, when the earth gets in the way of the moon, and the sun can't reach the moon, then you sometimes have it, what's called like a red moon. The moon looks really, really dark red. That's because there's no direct light um, hitting the moon at, 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 at the moon eclipse. Um, but the solar eclipse is very interesting because the mathematics and the scale, I think the, the sun is 44,000 or million miles away and the earth and the moon is exactly the right scale so that when it's in the way of the sun, it actually totally blocks out the sun. Even though the sun is a million times larger than the moon, the moon is the correct distance from the sun, or from the earth, in fact, that when it's in the way, it totally blocks the, the, the scale of the sun. So when it's exactly in position, that's when a, a full solar eclipse would occur, like that just would occur last week. Just for me to understand, surely there must be solar eclipses happening multiple times during the year, right? I mean, surely the moon gets in the way of the sun many times and some parts of the earth will experience either a partial or full solar eclipse. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I guess if they happen so often, what is so significant about this one that happened the other day, the 8th of April one? There's been a lot of hype around it. I've seen a lot of videos and articles and and people ref referencing previous solar eclipses. But if they happen so often, why is this 8th of April one causing such a raucous around the world? Now, I think I think the significance was that the eclipse this time was uh, traversing across the American continent. And it was uh, traversing across many, many cities um, <clears throat> from from the west coast all the way to the east coast, <clears throat> and it was occurring during the the day during that period, so the majority of the people were able then to witness it. I mean, we in South Africa, for example, I mean nothing really because it, it wasn't visible here. Yeah, and explain that. Why was it not visible here? Well, first, firstly, because it was a, it was aligning at midnight and uh, during our night time. Yeah, and the angle of where the sun is, uh, you know, the Americas on the virtually, you know, quarter way around around the planet. Because of the curvature of the Earth, America is like a quarter of the way around. So when when our sunset is going, the sunset is arising in America, in New York, for example, on the East Coast. But funny enough, the the the, the, the 
the path of, the, of the, this particular eclipse, I think, started in, in Mexico. So it actually started on the West Coast and traversed across okay. America to the East Coast. And so there was a band. The narrow band, everybody was in the middle of that path, saw a total eclipse. As, as they spread out across north and south, so they only got a partial eclipse. Yeah, and as you get further and further away, you probably see no eclipse. Exactly, exactly. That's why even if it, it occurred here, we wouldn't have seen anything. Even if it was, for example, it may be a different time. Okay, so you're saying even if it was daytime here in South Africa, we might not have seen the eclipse at all because we were just not at the right angle. We were not at the, at the right angle on planet Earth to see that the moon was blocking the sun. That's very interesting to note. So this is, the there's a few references I've seen on the internet and a few other videos. They're talking about other times this exact type of eclipse has happened in the past. I think, I think in 2017, in 2017 was the last eclipse across America at the same time, and it actually formed a cross. So this time, it went, this time it went that way, the last time it went that way. And so um, in 2017 and in 1999 and 2024, um, those were the both quite long eclipses across the American continent. But for some reason, um, this particular one was, was predicted a long time ago. <clears throat> and I'm not sure the significance other than the last time all the, uh, I think also because a lot of the planets aligned at the same time on that day. <clears throat> I think there was Mars and quite a lot of the planets all aligned at the same time, which is maybe why people applied more significance to it at that time. But yeah, so in 2017, they already were predicting the 2024 eclipse. And, and what is quite strange is that the pathway on this particular time passed through, I think, seven cities that somehow had the name of the eclipse or part of the eclipse in their name. I'm not sure the exact story, but I, we can try and check that out. But I mean, basically, it was quite extraordinary that, that the path traversed through these cities. It wasn't a straight line. It was like an S-curve or a curve like, like a, a, a low sine wave. So, I mean, a good friend of, of mine has told me that they're feeling unwell and uneasy and they're blaming it on the eclipse. They're not blaming it, but they're attributing that reason to the eclipse. They're saying the eclipse has done some shift in the energy and there's been a huge shift in energy um, throughout the cosmos maybe over the last couple of years. I mean, that doesn't really make sense to me. I haven't really felt anything energetically. I mean, I feel pretty much the same pre-eclipse and post-eclipse. So is my friend like just imagining things or is there something really happening that maybe some people are more receptive and sensitive to and the rest of us are, are not sensitive enough, you know, and just oblivious? Look, I think, you know, some people are more sensitive to, to, to planetary changes. I mean, there were, even from a planetary point of view, there were earthquakes, there were eruptions. There were, there were tornadoes, there were all sorts of uh, extreme weather things that happened on, 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 there was a tsunami in Thailand, I think it was in Thailand. Yeah, people that are more sensitive will, 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 will register these things, the same as a woman might register exactly where the moon is every month. So people that are more sensitive um, would, would affect it. I think females are affected more just by the moon every month because they're sensitive to that. And so there is, uh, you know, we, we are made up, we're electromagnetic, basically electricity, in, in fact. And so <clears throat> any electromagnetism is going to affect us, whether we're sensitive to it or we're um, aware of it. Um, 
I think I think in a city when there's so much noise and chaos and everything else, we we are somewhat cut off from nature. But you go outside and you outside during the day and the night and when a, a few days outside in the in the actual cosmos cycle, then then you become much more sensitive and aware of the position of the stars and and the, and the how the moon would affect you or the sun affect you during the day. If you're in, indoors all day and you're not exposed to the sun or the stars or the, or, the, or the moon, you're going to be less sensitive to it. But if you're outside and you're watching those cycles, you're exposed to those cycles particularly. And I think that's why also perhaps people that go and, and, and experience the, 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 the eclipse, it's an excuse to get out there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and get out of the stars and, and experience it with a whole bunch of people. And usually they're there for hours on end because they're waiting for it and etc. and the post time. And so, the, so they're out in that, in that cosmos and they're sharing those moments and they are being exposed to all that light and frequency. And so the magnetic, I mean, look how our oceans are affected by the moon. You know, the, 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 moon has, the moon has a huge effect on, on the planet and, and we don't we don't take cognizance most of the time yeah i guess if you talk to any surfer they'll tell you about how important it is to to follow the moon uh, to know when waves are coming right because the moon has such a huge impact i guess on the tides the waves and uh, and they need to monitor that. So I wanted to go back a bit. So you mentioned like on planet Earth, there was a bunch of planetary events that happened um, on the same day as this as this eclipse. Like you mentioned a tsunami, earthquakes, you know, these type of things. So that's potentially the Earth's electromagnetic field getting affected by this eclipse. And it's and it's reacting in this way. It's getting an earthquake and getting a tsunami. So in that same example, people who are sensitive to this would also have some sort of eruption. So around their body, they'll probably have some earthquake happening somewhere. They'll have a huge tsunami going through their body. And that's probably what they're experiencing. And that's why they were feeling so out of sorts. Well, you can imagine, you know, I mean, everything, everything is reliant on the sun, you know, so those solar flares and those energies that, I mean, what was quite extraordinary was the photographs that were coming out now because we could actually see um, the, the solar flares, you know, e erupting on, on, on the edges of the sun. <clears throat> and so those, those are huge billion miles, you know, of, of, of nuclear reaction. When that gets blocked, you know, there's nothing that blocks the sun. The sun is shining on the earth 24-7. And those and those energies and those waves and those frequencies are hitting the earth all the time. So suddenly you have a moment, four or five minutes, where it's not doing it anymore. Even in places like the other side of the earth, yeah, it's not going to affect you so much because it's in the dark anyway. So that's why some animals freak out. I mean, they weren't having a freak out, but the animals reacted differently. But some clustered together. You know, because they thought it was night time, or, or others, you know, weren't sure. Amazing. So, what should people that are affected by this eclipse? What is it that they can actually do? Look, a lot of a lot of cycles tend to signify a cycle. You know, every cycle, be it a, a moon cycle, an Earth cycle, a weekly cycle, eclipse cycle, signifies a cycle. You know, there is a birthday. Is because the sun is in the same position it was at the time of your birth. So every year, the sun is in that position. And so <clears throat> it's the beginning or the end of a cycle. So the, the eclipse is just a larger cycle. If we look at all the planets and everything, <clears throat> they all have different cycles and different frequencies. So some planets spin very, very fast. And they'll go around the sun like uh, 50 times. Some might be very, very slow and only go around every 25 or 30 years. 
So each planet has a different time cycle and a different sequence. And so much like a clock, your second hand is very different to your hour hand and very different to your minute hand. And if you've got a high-tech watch, you know, it can even have milliseconds. I guess there's a whole measuring, they're all measuring different cycles, like you said. So the planet that goes very quickly around in a very quick cycle, the planets that have much longer orbits around the sun is a much bigger cycle. And I guess be, us being on Earth, we compare all the cycles to us, right? So we say, for instance, Mercury has like an 80 or 90 day cycle around the sun. It takes 80 or 90 days for Mercury to do a whole uh, circuit. It takes us 365 days. And then all the planets we, we compare to, to an Earth day, right? But I guess on Mercury, a day on Mercury is dependent on how fast the planet actually spins on its axis. So for all, for all that I know, it might be 365 Mercury days for Mercury to do a whole, <laughs> a whole cycle, right? In fact, it was quite interesting. They, they, they showed recently sort of like a spirograph of the cycles of the different planets. And, you know, some are very, very fast and go like that, and some, as I say, are much longer cycles like that. And I guess also the, the scale of the planets also create a different kind of energy frequency. <clears throat> and so each of these things actually, I'm sure, ha has an effect on us. And I think the more sensitive we become, or the more sensitive the, the, um, our instruments become, then we're able to um, also get a better understanding of, of those cycles and, and of the, the, the frequencies um, and, and how they may affect us more or less. But I think the more we're aware, then I think we can say, oh, I'm feeling like this, so it's doing that. And now I know why, because of that, you know. So say, for example, somebody is affected quite effectively by, you know, the eclipse. When the next eclipse cap is going to happen, you can say, oh, I'm feeling like that. Now I know why, because the eclipse is coming. <clears throat> and that's how I felt the last time. And so <clears throat> I think the, the, the key point is that it is the beginning of the end of a cycle. This 2024 one was the beginning, I think, of a 2,000-year cycle. It's a huge cycle that was ending and beginning. <clears throat> and I think it might relate also to the Aquarian age, and how we've moved from the Piscarian to the Aquarian, and, and, and these transitions that we're going through on an Earth scale, um, you know, have also been predicted. You know, in the 60s, the whole thing, the age of Aquarius was upon us, you know, and I think that kicked in from 2012, is the beginning. But if it's a 2,000 or, or 2,500 year cycle, um, that's like half the human lifetime. If we assume we're only been around for five or 6,000 years. I see. So the last time this exact solar eclipse happened was roughly 2,000 years ago. I, I, think, I think so. I think that was the, the cycle they were talking about. I, I might be incorrect about the numbers, but it was a long time ago, and this was that cycle, and I'm not sure if it, it ties into that Mayan cycle, Mayan calendar cycle, or but but I think people are, are assigning quite a lot of significance to it because of that cycle. No, I understood. We are going into the Aquarian age since 2012. That makes sense from the Mayan predictions, and uh, there's a lot of literature, especially around all the spiritual and alternate um, healers, talking about the Aquarian age. So, Don, I actually wanted to go back to something you mentioned earlier. You said it's very easy for people to predict um that this eclipse was going to happen they predicted it in 2017 even even prior to that so maybe explain from your experience in the in the planetary uh, or working at the planetarium how do they predict these things so accurately what kind of yeah because it's like a clock i mean the cosmos is, is pretty much like a giant clock that's what i'm saying to you there are different cycles at different times we know how long it takes the moon to go around it doesn't change change speed and so next week we're going at 60 now we're going at 20 no we know exactly how long it's going to take we know how long it's going to take that's what i'm saying the the, the planetarium 
projector is actually just mimicking the cosmic clock. So when they set the planetarium, they can say, when they set all the dials on the planetarium, you set the year, then the month, then the day, then the hour, and then the minute, and then the second. So you've got different dials that set those, so you set the entire clock. So, so the professor got very upset with me because my assistant had let the clock run at high speed all night long. So when he came in the morning, it had gone back to 1945. So it took another few four five hours for him to wind it back again for his lecture, to put it back at the correct time. So that was when I obviously understood, oh, this is how this giant clock kind of works. And I think from a science point of view, that's why I think, oh, you know, the world is so predictable because like a clock. And to some extent, that's true. But there's so many millions of variables. And because the sky in 2002 is not the same as 2022, because the, the cosmos also moves on. The, the, the way we traverse through the cosmos, it's not just in a circle, it's in a spiral. So the, so the sun is actually moving through space and we're moving around the sun while it's moving through space. So you get sort of like this cone shaped spiral. Is the sun orbiting another sun? I think it is. I think it's orbiting the, the giant sun. But look, even here, Musk Musk's saying, you know, if we're going to go to Mars, whoever's going to go can't come back too far. Yeah, it's a one way trip. And that's Mars. That's our closest planet. That's like, you know, just a few hundred thousand kilometers. It's not, <laughs> it's not a light year. <laughs> it's not anywhere near a light year away. So that definitely puts, uh, puts some perspective on the scale. So just some questions I had, just some interesting questions I had about the cosmos. Well, how come our moon doesn't, doesn't spin on its axis? I mean, the moon does a rotation around the earth, but it doesn't spin. Because it just, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a moon. So it's a fixed thing. It, it just goes around. Like, I, I don't even think, I think we, either we turn and it's stationary in space or it rotates as well. I think it goes around like this, but, but it's always facing us. It itself doesn't rotate, which is why we never see the dark side of the moon. So I guess it does a slow rotation as it goes around the earth, but yeah, we only see the one side of the moon. Well, because it's going around like that. Is, is that the same for all the moons and all the planets? I don't think so. I think um, some places have got five moons, six moons, and I'm sure they'd all be different. But they say, but they say that our moon is not a moon, it's a, it's a space station. That's another good point, right? Because our moon, the, the moon of the earth, if you look at the size of the earth and the size of the moon and take that ratio, our moon has the highest size in relation to its planet. Like if you look at the moons of, of uh, Jupiter and Saturn and all the other planets, their moons are tiny, like in, in comparison to the planet. But our moon is like huge. Do you know any reason for that? That's uh, very odd. I think the most, the most interesting aspect is that the scale of the sun and the, and the scale of the moon and the position of the moon is so freaky that it perfectly covers the sun, even though the sun is 40 times bigger than the moon, or 400 times, I think. But the fact that the moon is so close to us and the scale of it perfectly, but by the, the millimeter, exactly fits to cover the sun. And that's the extraordinary numbers. And, 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 and the mathematics of all of that is extraordinary. But the moon also is closer to the Earth at some times and further away from the Earth at some times. No, no, it does get closer and further away. And the clo when, when it's, it's closest, it's called the blue moon. So when the moon is closest to us, it's called the blue moon. And when it's eclipsed, it's a red moon. Okay, when it's eclipsed at night time. And invariably, you know, it's going to be full moon and, you know, then it will turn red. When is the last time we had an eclipse here in South Africa? I, I've never seen an eclipse as long as I've been alive. I mean, I always hear about the eclipses, you know, I hear about it on the news and then it's never here in SA. It's like always China or some other place. And I mean, when are we going to get our eclipse? I, I think we've had a few um, partial eclipses here. 
I think I've seen a few partial eclipses, and you're more likely to see a moon eclipse than a solar eclipse. But there have been. I'm sure we could Google it and see when when South Africa did have eclipses. Yeah, I'm, I guess it would have happened sometime. It must be on this giant clock that uh, <laughs> that happens. There's everyone gets their fair share of eclipses and sunshine and and everything. I guess the clock doesn't uh, doesn't discriminate. Doesn't speed up or slow down. Yeah, it doesn't discriminate. Doesn't skip. doesn't matter what color, size, shape, age. You'll all be eclipsed. Yeah, I guess it's the great uh, consistency that you can rely on. The rhythm, the cycle. Everything has the cycle, and that's what the cosmos really is. And I think that's really what I've taken from this conversation is that this is a huge cycle that's actually playing out in the universe. And there's a 2000 year or 2000 odd year cycle that is just completed. And that's what this eclipse is, is uh, signifying. So it's the start of a, a new cycle potentially and the end of a, of a previous cycle. And just like from going from winter to summer, we're going from one season to another. It's just on a much bigger scale. It's not a few months, it's thousands of years. So it makes sense. It makes sense that uh, we're going into a new energy, I guess, because it's a cycle. So the cycle of energy is changing and we're entering a new one. And I think if we take cognizance of that and take heed of that, so if we close the old and open the new, then we can set either throw away what we didn't want from before, and we can invite in the new and, and envision a, a, a new path. The same is that, you know, what you can set a, a New Year's resolution, we can set a new 2000 year resolution. No, as a human, we can say, where do you want to be in 2000 years? Because we know the last 2000 years, give or take, right? I mean, and we must, and we must have been there because we're here now, reincarnated over the last 2000 years, I'm sure. Yeah, that's another cycle, the cycle of life, the planet, but that's a different cycle. Don, that was really fascinating, very interesting to chat about uh, about this eclipse and how it affects us and the really important thing about being a cycle. So guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this topic and this discussion. Uh, we will be covering more interesting topics next week. You can read the description below the video. I'll leave details about uh, Don and also details about the eclipse. Till next week, guys. Thank you very much. We'll see you shortly. Thanks. Cheers.